Okay, I suppose we should uh, get underway here. Uh, my name is Larry Stewart. I was I, I was been asked to uh, introduce Steve, which is a bit odd, uh, since everyone knows him uh, and who's brought us all together. However, I can tell you a few things you will not particularly know, maybe not even interested. <laughs> uh, you know, I, well, uh, nothing terribly uh, controversial. Um, I think Steve and I have known one another for, scary, at least a quarter of a decade, more, maybe perhaps more, um, uh, when he was... A decade, that's <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's... Oh, <laughs> Uh, there's the, yes, well, I had very little sleep last night. Um, in any event, Steve uh, and I met when I think he was still an undergraduate at Victoria. Uh, and then we had a very uh, interesting encounter when he, in a, was it a bar in LA? Uh, where I think, which must have been the first time in that particular bar anyway, a, a defense of a thesis took place, Steve's, and Jim, Jim Force and I were the examiners, and we had quite a good afternoon, I have to say. Um, I don't think uh, Steve quite was sure what on earth was going on, but we were enjoying ourselves. Uh, but what we did uh, find very impressive, as, as all of you will know, is that Steve is very, very meticulous and does incredibly precise work. Uh, particularly, I think, what's very interesting to me, for at least from my work, was that this the general scholium fits in a very interesting place in the entire Enlightenment project where there were many involved. It's not a matter of two or three people debating fine points of metaphysics, but there is in fact a much wider and broader horizon here, I think. Anyway, uh, there is of course, as you would expect, a handout. Uh, so we'll hear from Steve and I'll pass this around. Thank you very much, uh, Larry. Um, I do well remember that uh, PhD thesis uh, defense in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, it wasn't a bar. I don't think it was a bar. It was more of a. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to refer to it as a coffee house, um, but um, I, I do remember it being quite distracting watching Larry eating a carrot cake while he was examining me and. Um, and there was a baseball game playing on one of the TV monitors <laughs> behind. So, uh, but since uh, one chapter of my thesis was on coffee house culture, it was, it was rather uh, appropriate. Uh, but in fact, I, I do want to um, uh, thank uh, both uh, Larry Stewart and uh, James Force uh, for helping to uh, interest me in uh, the general scolium. So. Larry's paper from 1996, History of Science, Seeing Through the uh, Scolium, and also uh, Jim Force's paper, uh, Newton and the God of Dominion, are two papers that stimulated my interest uh, in the uh, general scolium. So I'm happy to have uh, Larry here. And I also spoke to uh, Jim uh, just yesterday, and he is with us uh, in spirit, and uh, we have uh, asked his advice a little bit uh, about uh, the, the uh, formation of this uh, symposium. So what I want to do uh, this morning is, I think, probably ask uh, more questions than uh, I'll provide answers for. This is very much a work in um, progress. And this is in part because uh, it has so many layers. I want to, first of all, begin by saying that the title, Science and Religion, Newton's General Scolium, to the Principia uh, has two terms that uh, need to be unpacked a little bit, science and religion. I want to just state at the outset that I'm using these terms as a kind of a shorthand. Um, obviously, uh, we've already uh, heard from uh, Andrew about the problems of essentialism, that science isn't a static entity that remains unchanging <laughs> over time, uh, and the same goes for uh, religion. So. Uh, that is just uh, a comment about the limitations of the language as we see it in the title of my paper. However, in very broad terms, I want to look at 
uh, the ways in which Newton's uh, study of nature interacts uh, with his theology and his uh, religious faith. Now, I have put together some uh, word clouds uh, that give you a sense of the diversity of this text, the general scolium, uh, but I also want to draw your attention to the word deus, which uh, this is from the Latin, first Latin 1713 edition of the general scolium. Uh, that word would be larger if we included uh, its occurrences in other cases. And maybe one day I'll produce another version of it so that uh, makes um, that alteration. In the second edition, you can see that deus is even larger. So this is obviously a central feature of the text, but all around it you see uh, terms that of course we associate with science and the history of science. And this is the uh, English edition of the third edition, 1726 uh, edition. So you can see sun, comets, uh, planets, distances, uh, as well as some theological terms, uh, dominion, lord, and of course uh, God in uh, the center as the uh, central uh, feature. So I want to just think a little bit about how the science, if you will, uh, relates to the theology in this text and how that might um, speak to the wider context of Newton's thought. Uh, here you see one of the drafts of the general scolium and down at the bottom there you can see some uh, verses. These are verses about uh, space, God in space. So in the uh, drafts, and some of the drafts he present some verses. Some of those verses uh, do end up in the published edition, and that is a very important feature of the text. And here you have the third edition, one page from the third edition, uh, which shows the footnote on God, which is new for the third uh, edition. All right. Just a brief outline of what this paper ultimately will include. Uh, we have uh, the text itself to study, uh, but not only the printed versions, 1713 and 1726, uh, and the content of those printed uh, versions, uh, but also the editorial history, and this includes not only drafts A to E, but various other fragments that uh, have come to light and we want to look at all of those ultimately uh, to get a sense for the meaning of the published text. The way I approach this is we have a published text. It's the text that Newton agreed to publish. To, he agreed to release this to the world, uh, but there is an editorial uh, substratum that helps us uh, define uh, the meaning of the text through a process of uh, triangulation. The wider context is the Principia itself, all three editions. Notably, the first edition includes a reference to God only once and one reference to the scriptures. Uh, the second edition also contains uh, Coates' preface, which includes some natural theology, some references to the design argument with an apologetic edge, because he wants to argue that the design argument as we see it emerging from the general scolium, the text as a whole uh, can uh, provide ammunition against atheists. Uh, Newton's other publications, the queries to the optics, 28 and 31, are especially important, the Commercium Epistolicum, other texts that are being written around this time, both published and unpublished. Uh, with respect to the unpublished material, Newton's private manuscripts, which of course are vast, but the all-important uh, Bentley letters of 1692 and 1693, which have already been mentioned. Uh, fifthly, there is Newton's immediate historical context. Uh, other writings on uh, science and religion, and again, I'm using science and religion here as a kind of a shorthand, uh, uh, before his time that uh, he may have uh, found um, sympathetic to his own views or that played a shaping role. Uh, contemporary theological dynamics and uh, the natural theology of his time. And then, of course, feedback relationships. And uh, this symposium, we've already begun to talk about these feedback relationships, where we see that Newton is, in the various stages of developing the general scolium, uh, responding to uh, criticisms. So there's an apologetic element to this. 
and several of the papers, including Eric's, uh, will deal with this uh, apologetic aspect. And then there are interpretations of the science and religion themes in the general scholium uh, by others who are his followers. So Clark in the Leibniz Clark correspondence, uh, Whiston's astronomical principles of religion. These provide us with a lot of insight, but of course we have to be careful because Clark uh, is not Newton and some of his views do differ and clearly Whiston is not Newton either. Uh, there are lots of similarities. Uh, both of these men had uh, intimate contact with uh, Newton, Cl uh, Clark uh, to the end of Newton's life. Uh, Whiston uh, did have a, a break with, with Newton in the middle of the 17 teens, but before that did have intimate uh, contact with them. So uh, their testimony is important, but it has to be used with caution. Number eight, the role played by the general scholium and related documents in the history of the design argument and the argument from fine tuning. This is a larger issue that we don't need to consider ourselves with too much here, uh, but it is interesting that the design argument as we see it in the general scholium is often cited as a sort of a classic text in the history of the design argument. Uh, and then we have historiography on science and religion in the general scholium. So the study of uh, science and religion in the general scholium by those who study science and religion, uh, religion in the early modern period, uh, etc. So there's a, a small base of historiography that uh, I'll certainly be considering as I uh, render this uh, presentation into a publishable text. So here are some questions that we might want to ask with respect to the science and religion themes in the general scholium. First of all, we have the fact of the general scholium. And this is something that uh, Stefan has uh, begun to address in his paper. Uh, it's there, right? So this raises the question, why is it there? What were the motivations uh, to add this? Is there some kind of reflexive dynamic? Is Newton uh, responding to some criticisms about uh, putative um, uh, irreligion, perhaps, in the first edition of the general scholium, which could, to some observers, look uh, quite uh, secular. So that's uh, one reality that uh, we need to uh, try to explain. Why is it there? Uh, the motivations for including the general scholium, I think, inevitably are multiple. Uh, but the theological ones would be paramount amongst those. Uh, number two, uh, we have, as we look at the physical text of the Principia, these theological bookends, because, of course, uh, towards the end of Coates' preface, uh, he launches into this articulation of the design argument, which is quite compatible with what we see in uh, the general scholium. Of course, Coates had access to the general scholium. So how does this change the status of the text? Is it the case that the second and third editions of the Principia uh, are different theologically than the first text, which does not have the general scholium? Uh, this is an interesting question, and it's uh, raised in various uh, contexts. Uh, is this a kind of uh, cloak of uh, orthodoxy um, or religiosity that Newton wanted to add to the, general, to, to the Principia uh, to make it look less secular? Uh, there are all kinds of questions that can uh, be asked, but nevertheless, again, we have the fact that we have the design argument at the beginning of the Principia and the design argument at the end. And they frame the context uh, and uh, they frame the content of the text. Natural theology and the design argument in Newton's uh, lifetime and before, you've got John Ray, you've got Bishop Wilkins, there are many uh, writing on this. To what degree does the natural theology and the design argument in the general scholium relate to those authors? And then there is divine action and dominion. So divine action is an expression that's used by people who study uh, science and religion and the way that God uh, relates uh, to the world. So what is the relationship of God to nature and the cosmos? Newton does touch on this in the general scholium, uh, but of course, uh, more elaborately in unpublished texts. Number five, parallels between the absolute relative distinction in God's discussion of God and the similar distinction in his natural philosophy. So we see this first in the scholium on the definitions, uh, present from uh, the first edition, uh, but we also see, of course, uh, an interesting discussion of the relative nature of the word God. To what degree does that distinction between absolute and relative in his theology relate to uh, 
the distinction Newton wants to make between absolute and relative space, place, time, and motion in uh, the scolium. And the scolium on the definitions is present from the 1687 edition. Number six, the relationship between the theology of God's eternity and omnipresence and Newton's conceptions of time and space in philosophy and physics. We have other texts other than general scolium, but the general scolium is one text that will help us answer that question. Number seven, science and religion in the general scolium and uh, Newton's other writings. So the science and religion content in the general scolium and related ideas and writings uh, elsewhere in Newton's corpus. And then what I'm calling the programmatic statement, uh, just how for Newton does, this, does discoursing about God from the appearances of things certainly belong to natural philosophy? I'm not going to provide a full answer uh, to this question, uh, but I certainly would be interested in hearing uh, uh, others uh, and their thoughts on what that statement means. But I'm calling it the programmatic statement. It comes right at the end of the theological section, so it's in an emphatic position in the text. Number nine, what does the general scholium tell us about Newton's views on the relationship between natural theology and natural philosophy? And somewhat differently, number 10, what does the general scholium tell us about Newton's views on the relationship between theology and natural theology. So the question of natural theology and the question of theology. Theology proper absolutely does exist in the general scholium as well. And this is something that uh, others will address, uh, including uh, Paul Greenham. Now, there are various models that have been presented over the years to explain the relationship between Newton's science and religion. I don't want to keep apologizing for using these terms as shorthand, so just assume that uh, that is what I'm doing uh, from now on. So protopositivism, the idea that Newton adhered to some uh, sort of complete separation, methodological, epistemological, uh, goal-oriented, uh, so a separation between uh, the science and religion. And then there's the, the argument from, from Dodich, uh, which uh, was uh, popular in the early 19th century, uh, Jean-Baptiste Biot arguing that, yes, of course, there's theology in Newton's writings, but the, that theology uh, does date to uh, later in his life after the holy text of the Principia was already uh, published. And that, of course, is compatible with a positivistic view. Now, it turns out that Newton did write a lot of theology uh, in his advancing years. And so you know, this particular argument is not completely wrong, but it is also the case that some of Newton's most vibrant theology dates to before he began to compose uh, than Percipia. So the situation is, is much more complex than this uh, argument uh, implies. There's the argument that Newton's theology is culturally determined, so it is a product of his time, and at that level it's unexceptional. Um, well, I think you know, there's something in this particular uh, argument, but I think anyone who knows anything about Newton's uh, theology uh, would conclude that uh, Newton was extremely exceptional. Uh, very few lay uh, believers wrote as much on theology as Newton did. And of course, there's the added but very important uh, detail that Newton's theology was not mainstream. It was heretical by the standards of the day. Uh, so I think that argument uh, has problems too. Uh, Post-Principia justification, so the idea that uh, Newton turns to theology, he's conquered physics, uh, he's very hubristic, uh, and he wants to uh, tackle other fields and after the fact uh, adds the general scolium uh, to make the Principia look as if it was theologically oriented all along. A partial integration, so this would be a kind of semi-overlapping magisteria that in general terms Newton kept science and religion separate, but there were points of contact. Undifferentiated unity, the idea that Newton doesn't make any distinctions. It's all part of the same study to discover God uh, in nature, and obviously various combinations uh, of the above. Uh, my view probably lies somewhere between partial integration and undifferentiated unity, but I wouldn't want to define it any more precisely than that. Now, the first edition of the Principia, there is this one reference to God, and it's not only a reference to God, but it is an example of natural theology. God therefore placed the planets at different distances from the sun so that according to the degrees of density, they may enjoy a greater or less proportion of the sun's heat. So this is a 
early example of the anthropic principle. Interestingly enough, in the second and third editions, the word God disappears, but I would argue that God is still there in the, in the passive tense. Uh, this is still a design argument, but the word God disappears. But of course, he more than compensates for that omission by adding the general scolium, which, as you just saw from the word clouds, uh, has God as, as the central feature. Now, we have some insight into Newton's intentions for the Principia in his uh, correspondence with Bentley, and we've already had occasion to refer to this in a previous presentation. When I wrote my treatise about our system, I had an eye upon such principles as might work with considering men for the belief of a deity, and nothing can rejoice me more than to find it useful for that purpose. But if I have done the public any service this way, it is due to nothing but industry and patient thought. Now, I think it's worth pausing at this moment and just um, asking the question of what we might expect Isaac Newton to say when uh, a young, enthusiastic uh, clergyman uh, writes him a letter and says, you know, I want to use your, your Principia uh, to bolster uh, my Boyle lectures and their arguments in favor of uh, natural theology. So one argument would be, well, of course, he's going to say that all along his Principia had uh, this intent. Um, Another interpretation of this would be that Newton is entirely sincere, that that was his intent uh, all along. I think the truth probably lies somewhere between those two uh, positions, because I think it's, it's very clear that the correspondence with, uh, with Bentley actually energized him and, and took him uh, to another uh, stage. However, it is the case that Newton was interested in natural theology before uh, the Principia. Some of the issues that come up even in the general scolium exist before uh, 1687. Nevertheless, I think this was an imp important moment uh, for Newton. So I, I think it, it is um, uh, something that did uh, stimulate Newton, uh, but these are not uh, ideas that are um, entirely new. So it, here's one example. On the distinction between shining and opaque bodies in the heavens, Newton says, I do not think this is Excapable by ma mere natural causes, but I'm forced to ascribe it to the counsel and contrivance of a voluntary agent. That's the design argument. Uh, to make the system, therefore, with all its motions, required a cause which understood and compared together the quantities of matter in the several bodies of the sun and planets and the gravitating powers resulting from thence, and to compare and adjust all these things together in so great a variety of bodies, argues that cause to be not blind and fortuitous, but very well skilled in mechanics and geometry. The diurnal or daily rotations of the sun and planets, as they could hardly arise from any cause purely mechanical, so by being determined all the same way with annual and menstrual motions, they seem to make up that harmony in the system, which was the effect of choice rather than chance. By chance, he may be thinking rather loosely of some kind of uh, Epicurean scheme. But nevertheless, it is another example of the design argument. Now, uh, we have, and you can see some of this material on your handout. So in the section, natural, <coughs> Newton on Natural Theological Utility uh, of the Principia, we have an example from the letter to Bentley. And we also have these uh, wonderful examples from Roger Coates' uh, preface. So there's two examples from the 16, 1713 edition of the Principia. And then we have this interesting testimony from Whiston. And remember, Whiston did have intimate contact with Newton, but they broke around uh, 1740. We have to use Whiston's uh, testimony with caution because it's quite clear that there is at least a degree of self-interest. I well remember that when I early asked him why he did not at first draw such consequences from his principles, the Principia, as did as Dr. Bentley soon did in his excellent sermons at Mr. Boyle's lectures, as I soon did in my new theory, 1696, and more largely afterward in my astronomical principles of religion, 1717, 1725, and as that great mathematician Mr. Coates did in his excellent preface in the later editions of Sir Isaac Newton's Principia, we've just mentioned those, I mean for the advantage of natural religion and the interposition of the divine power and providence in the constitution of the world. His answer was that he saw those consequences, but thought it better to let his readers draw them first of themselves, which consequences, however, he did in great measure 
draw himself long afterwards in the later editions of the Principia and in that admirable general scolium at its conclusion and elsewhere in his optics. Now it's interesting uh, to note that Whiston produced the very first English translation of a portion of the general scolium, the uh, theological portion, uh, portion, within days of his receiving the newly printed 1713 uh, edition. So obviously that was in Latin. Whiston produces an English translation uh, for the benefit of his readers. So uh, Whiston celebrated the general scolium because he had already committed himself to a natural theological apologetics. Now, do we take this testimony straightforwardly? I would argue that probably we shouldn't. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think probably uh, some of what we see here uh, does reflect uh, Newton's uh, own thoughts. Now, in uh, the general scolium, we have this famous uh, section, and this is the one that's often quoted uh, by people who point out that Newton articulated the design argument. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And if the fixed stars are the centers of other like systems, these being formed by the likewise counsel must be all subject to, to the dominion of one. Uh, Newton being Unitarian, that term one there may have Unitarian implications, but it would also be compatible uh, in a Trinitarian uh, sense uh, with a, a Trinitarian reading. Uh, especially since the light of the fixed stars is of the same nature with the light of the sun, and from every system, light passes into all other systems. So we can see that there's a relationship between his articulation of the design argument and his commitment to a kind of monotheism. It's a, it's a strict monotheism with a uni unipersonal God, unity of phenomena associated with uh, the unity of God. Then he goes on to say, this being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, not as the anima mundi, but as Lord over all. And on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God Pantocrator, or universal ruler. For God is a relative word, so here's the reference to the relative absolute distinction I referred to earlier, and has a respect to servants, and deity is the dominion of God, not over his own body, as those who fancy God to be the soul of the world, but over servants. Now, there are some uh, heretical implications here. This isn't the place to talk about them. But I do want to stress this focus on God's dominion, because that's one of the things that does come out quite clearly in the general scolium, this notion of a God who has continuous dominion over the cosmos. So he, he is the creator and he is the sustainer, right? So he's setting his, his theology apart from uh, a deistic conception. The supreme God is a being eternal, infinite, absolutely perfect, but a being However perfect, without dominion, cannot be said to be Lord God, for we say, my God, your God, the God of Israel, the God of gods, the Lord of lords. But we do not say, my eternal, your eternal, the eternal of Israel, the eternal of gods. We do not say, my infinite or my uh, perfect. These are titles which have respect to servants. The word God usually signifies Lord, but every Lord is not a God. It is the dominion of a spiritual being which constitutes a God. So much of this is uh, theology proper. Newton wants to define God as a term that has uh, functional um, uh, meaning rather than ontological meaning. And so he compares it to the word God, which, sorry, the word Lord, which most people would understand as having more of a functional or relational uh, kind of meaning. So this is theology, but it also relates to his notion of God's uh, sovereignty over uh, the uh, universe. And that, of course, relates more to his natural theology and also his conception of how the universe operates and, of course, famously, his belief that God uh, needs to intervene. Uh, for Leibniz, this is an infelicity. God should have been able to have created the world as a perpetual motion machine. But Newton says, no, uh, my God is a loving God who is interested in uh, the, the creation and continually upholds it and intervenes uh, when necessary. So Newton doesn't see that as an infelicity. So there's some other uh, examples of language that we find in the general scolium, for example, in the uh, commer commercium epistolicum, uh, that one, Newton, uh, teaches that God, the God in whom we live and move and have our being. So there's a quotation from Acts 17.28, which we also find in uh, the general scolium. And uh, he's, of course, contrasting this view of God uh, with the view of uh, Leibniz, intelligentia uh, supermundana. Uh, 
there is a, a possibility of a, a biblical line already in the first edition in this expression uh, from infinity to infinity. And it reappears in the general scolium in a context that makes clear that it is talking about God. And uh, the language uh, is very similar to what we find in uh, the book of Psalms, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So this is just a suggestion that there might be a little more theology even in the first edition. But it's interesting to see that that language does recur in the, the general scolium. And it, in that case, it is clearly uh, theological. Newton includes uh, a note on space. And here's another example where we have theology, yes, but it relates to his conception of the cosmos, uh, God's uh, inf in infinite uh, omnipresence. And ultimately, Newton wants to associate this with how gravity operates, uh, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, this uh, argument that we don't have any idea of the substance of God, I mean, at one level it sounds very uh, Lacanian, uh, but it fits into, I think, uh, his general approach to theology, which is more of a functionalist understanding of, of who God is, uh, using relational language, uh, rather than uh, what could, argue, could arguably be, be referred to as a more Greek understanding of taking the word God to uh, refer to ontology and substance. I think ultimately this fits into his anti-Trinitarianism because Newton does see uh, the Trinitarian conception as, I think, excess excessively uh, ontological. But arguably, and, and others may disagree, this uh, kind of phenomenalistic understanding of a God is similar to the way he approaches uh, nature. So he has, a dis has descriptive laws. He can describe nature mathematically, but he doesn't want to get into the substances of things. So is that a, uh, a possible link between his science and religion? Uh, that's just a, a suggestion. Uh, here is a, uh, one of the drafts, a uh, lesser known draft, of, of um, the uh, general scolium, parts of the general scolium, but around it you can see uh, several statements that actually are much more uh, theological in nature. So this is very small, but it says um, human, human souls uh, are immortal, uh, not uh, through natural causes, uh, but through the will of God, right? Uh, so that actually, I think, is a potentially heretical statement. It deals with uh, Newton's view of the soul. And then, as you move on, you have discussions about God's dominion, which are very similar to what we see in the general scolium. So here we see the relationship between the natural theology, the general conception of the God of the universe, uh, and uh, more uh, directly theological statements. Okay, here's the programmatic statement. Uh, we first see it in draft B of the general scolium, and thus much concerning God to discourse of whom from the appearances of things certainly does pertain to uh, experimental philosophy. From the phenomenon appear the immediate causes of things, from these causes higher ones until one comes to the supreme cause. And then in the 1713 edition, and thus much concerning God. Remember, this is at the very end of the theological section, so it's in a very emphatic position to discourse of about whom from the appearances of things certainly does pertain to experimental philosophy. And the, the big difference in the 1726 edition is that it's now natural, theolo uh, natural philosophy, which is arguably a broader uh, statement. So as I wrap up, I just want to look at some other kinds of uh, programmatic statements that might give us some insight into Newton's view of the relationship between science and religion. Uh, so in uh, Yehuda uh, manuscript 41 from early 1690s, Talking about the original religion, he says, "'Twas one design of the first institution of the true religion to propose to mankind by the frame of the ancient temples the study of the frame of the world as the true temple of the great God they worship. And thence it was that the priests anciently were above other men well skilled in the knowledge of the true frame of nature and accounted it a great part of their theology." So their natural philosophy, as it were, was actually a part of their theology. Uh, and then uh, this uh, particular text, which uh, was uh, first um, discussed by um, uh, Professor McGuire, uh, one principle in philosophy is the being of a God or spirit, infinite, eternal, omnipresent, omnipotent. So this does seem to be consistent with the programmatic statement in the general scolium. But then we have this statement, that religion and philosophy are to be preserved distinct, we are not to introduce divine revelations into philosophy, nor philosophical opinions into religion. 
And similarly, uh, this one from Whiteside's mathematical papers, what is taught in metaphysics, if it is derived from de divine revelation, is religion. If it is derived from phenomena through the five external senses, it pertains to physics, etc. So these texts uh, do, do tend to suggest uh, some kind of uh, separation. Now, uh, just a couple lines from uh, the queries. Later philosophers banished the considerations of such a cause of out of natural philosophy, feigning hypotheses for explaining all things mechanically and referring other causes to metaphysics, whereas the main business of natural philosophy is to argue from phenomena without feigning hypotheses and to deduce causes from effects till we come to the very first cause, which certainly is not me uh, mechanical. So this is natural <coughs> theological argument that natural philosophy will lead you to the discovery of God in nature. Does it not appear from phenomena that there is a being incorporeal, living, intelligent, omnipresent, who in infinite space, as it were in his sensory, sees the things themselves intimately and thoroughly perceives them and comprehends them wholly by their immediate presence to himself, of which things the images only carried through the organs of sense into our little sensoriums are there seen and beheld by that which in us perceives and thinks. And though every true step made in philosophy brings us not immediately to the knowledge of the first cause, yet it brings us nearer to it, and on that account is to be highly valued. So this does seem to be consistent with what he's saying uh, to Bentley in 1692 and 93. And then we have his dual reformation as articulated in Query 31. In this third book, I have only begun the analysis of what remains to be discovered about light and its effects upon the frame of nature, hinting several things about it and leaving the hints to be examined and improved by the farther experiments and observations of such as are inquisitive. And if natural philosophy in all its parts, natural philosophy in all its parts, by pursuing, pursuing this method, the experimental method, shall at length be perfected, the bounds of moral philosophy will also be enlarged. For so far as we can know by natural philosophy, what is the true cause, so using natural philosophy to discover God in nature, what power he has over us, and what benefits we receive from him, so far our duty towards him, as well as that towards one another, will appear to us by the light of nature. And no doubt, if the worship of false gods had not blinded the heathen, their moral philosophy would have gone farther than to the four cardinal virtues of Plato, etc. And instead of teaching the transmigration of souls and to worship the sun and the moon and dead heroes, they would have taught us to worship our true author and benefactor as their ancestors did under the government of Noah and his sons before they corrupted themselves. So we see an interest in idolatry here that you also see at the very end of each of the two footnotes in the final edition of the General Scolium. And uh, just a, uh, a couple examples uh, uh, from Clark, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, so this is from the uh, Leibniz-Clark correspondence. When I said that the mathematical principles of philosophy are opposite to those of the materialists, the meaning was that whereas materialists supposed the frame of nature to be such as could have arisen from mere mechanical principles of matter and motion, of necessity and fate, the math mathematical principles of philosophy show on the contrary, that the state of things, the constitution of the sun and planets, is such as could not arise from anything but an intelligent and free cause. And then this rejection of the clockwork universe, which many people associate with Newton and, and see it as a Newtonian invention. And Clark here repudiates it, and there's no strong evidence in Newton's own writings that Newton held to a clockwork universe theory. The notion of the world's being a great machine going on without the interposition of God as a clock continues to go on without the assistance of a clockmaker is the notion of materialism and fate and tends under pretense of making God a supramundane intelligence to exclude providence and God's government in reality out of the world. So uh, this is in response to uh, Leibniz in the Leibniz-Clark correspondence and the Newtonians seem to view Leibniz's view as tantamount uh, to deism. So I think although it's difficult to tell uh, what model, if you will, of the relationship between science and religion Newton held, uh, it's quite clear that Newton sees the uh, role and the dominion of God uh, in nature to be an important part of his natural uh, uh, philosophy and that he holds that God is not only the creator but also the sustainer of the, the uh, beautiful system of sun, moon, uh, stars and planets that he uh, describes in the general scolium. <laughs>
Um, but you know the drill. So uh, why don't you, anyone wish to take a stab at the mic here? And you go ahead. Um, thank you for your very rich paper, uh, Stephen. Um, a quick comment and a genuine question. Quick comment is, I think you understate the reframing of the Principia by leaving out the changes to the uh, preliminary poem by Halley Zod. Because Halley Zod is a really Epicurean tract and then gets shifted around in the second and third editions. So, um, and also the book ends in the first edition on the treatment of comets, which is a standard Epicurean <laughs> um, you know, uh, leitmotif. Um, my question is on your terminology of functional language, because I agree with you that the terminology there is not uh, in your register metaphysical or theological, but um, I would have used more uh, moral psychological or even political as the way to describe it, because it looks what Newton is saying to me, is don't bother too much about metaphysics here. What matters is, is our <laughs> A political or moral relationship to God. And that's itself um, in some ways extremely heretical too. Um, because it says we can disagree on metaphysics as long as we um, have the right kind of orientation to whatever is higher than us. Uh, but since I'm not a specialist on this kind of matter, I was just wondering why you used functional rather than emphasize either moral psychological or political as the way to describe that? Well, I use functional, and, and again, there may be limitations in the language. I appreciate those uh, comments, Eric, uh, because I, I think it does describe the way he describes, um, the way he characterizes the word God. Uh, so God is not God purely in terms of his essence, but he's God by virtue of being God of Israel, God of gods, et cetera, et cetera. So it has a kind of a functional role, the term, and a relational role as well, so that God is defined by what he is God of, et cetera, et cetera. And this helps Newton explain, uh, and, and you don't see this in the general scolium um, other than indirectly. It helps explain how judges, magistrates in ancient Israel, Psalm 82, uh, angels uh, in uh, the book of Job, uh, and ultimately, although it's not mentioned directly, uh, Christ could be referred to uh, as God because the term for Newton in the Hebrew has a, has a functional meaning and, and, a, and a relational meaning. So a, a Hebrew judge can, can be called Elohim. Uh, so what he's saying is that Hebrew judge is the political leader of Israel. Yeah, yeah. So what he's saying is that God is our political sovereign as much as, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm well, thinking that when you use mm -hmm. function Well, well, no, I, I, think, I think there's actually a lot in that. So Newton's view of God, I think, is quite similar to the dynamic monarchianism that we see in the early centuries of the Christian era. So that you have uh, you know, this one supreme God almighty, but then you have delegated authority. And, and that, I think, is what Newton is saying about, about Christ, is that Christ's authority is, is a delegated authority. So it's not an authority that is native to him, it's rather deferred from, from the Almighty. So yeah, I, I think that the political aspect actually works within that context of dyma dynamic monarchianism. Okay, we have quite a few other questions. Modi, and then we'll go this way. So Modi, you want to? Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, obviously, you raise uh, a lot of issues uh, uh, that need to be discussed, but I want to focus on one that relates to the Yehuda 41, because uh, obviously Newton's uh, reworking the Principia in general, and the general scolium in particular, uh, pertains to other stuff that he was doing at the, uh, at the same time. Now when uh, he cites, um, uh, when he writes the Yehuda 41 in the early 1690s, he has a certain conception about what was the origin of everything after the flood. And then it's uh, important for him to make the statement that you made that theology and natural philosophy were one. Uh, those were the original pure uh, 
uh, endowments by God. By the time he writes the general scolium, that entire structure disappears. Uh, he no longer believes that he has access to what happened after the flood because the theory that emerges by then that will come very prominent in the chronology is that there was no memory of those events. Uh, so the entire structure of the relationship between God <coughs> and natural philosophy that dominated his thought from around 1684 to the mid-1690s changes. Now, my question is, what happens to that particular structure? I mean, if it disappears from what would become the chronology and later writings, I mean, to what extent can we argue that he, that he retains that kind of a connection between uh, uh, the god of, of Noah and the natural philosophy since his own thinking is that we do not know that anymore. I mean, so something changed there that I think has significance to your argument. Right, yeah, um, it's, it's an excellent question. And um, my first response is that uh, you having uh, Modi just written a, a book about this are much better to answer it than uh, myself. So I use that example from Yehuda 41 because I think at least at the time, uh, that statement about the, the ancient Magi and the way they operated was not merely descriptive, I think, it, in my view, it was prescriptive for, for, for Newton. He saw that as an ideal uh, for, for the way uh, natural philosophy should um, be prosecuted. Now, you ra raise a very important question uh, about how that would um, impinge on something that Newton is writing in, in, in 1713, like, like the, um, uh, the general scolium. So I'm not making any claims. Uh, there are some very important diachronic issues here about how uh, Newton's thought uh, changes and shifts. And I think traditionally, Newton scholars have not paid enough attention to those diachronic issues and have tended to, as almost a default view, uh, one position that Newton held you know, in a certain decade to sort of hold true later on. And I think we really need to think very carefully about how Newton's thought uh, is changing. And that particular example from Yehuda 41 clearly does relate to a project that he's involved in in the, uh, in the uh, early 1690s. Um, however, he does still refer to the Noachic religion um, in uh, the queries, um, and I think they're alluded to in the, in the general scholium as well. So that's still there. He, he still seems to want to say something about that and still seems to have a conception of a, of a kind of a pristine uh, religion. Uh, but um, I wouldn't want to, to say any, any more about that. But I, I really do think the diachronic issues are important. And certainly for my own purposes, I need to think about them carefully when I write this paper up. So thanks. Uh, just, just let me say one thing. Where there's a kind of discussion because there is a whole. However, uh, I'm quite happy to let you continue forever if you wish. Uh, so um, uh, I'll just we'll leave it open until you want to stop. Much you, you know, Steve. You, you obviously know these manuscripts so so well. I do want to push two issues. One is the contextual idea that, lay that Newton is somehow unique as a lay believer in doing theology. That I really, really, actually, just don't think works contextually. And I'll give you two examples of Newton's colleagues in the Royal Society. Which the first one is John Evelyn, for whom we have three. No, sorry, seven huge folio volumes of manuscripts in the British Library of him doing theology in this kind of historical theology, speculating about Noah and so on. And of course, he's not an anti-Trinitarian. He's a nice, good Anglican, but he's doing exactly this sort of thing. And another, perhaps even more interesting example, who is secretary of the Royal Society, is Abraham Hill. For who, who is also a layman, but for whom we have three huge volumes, again, we're talking big fat folios, of manuscript notes, again in the British Library, uh, on theological issues, historical theological issues. And the work I'm doing at the Folger just now is exactly looking at these kind of commonplace books. Everyone loves, laymen love doing theology. So, I mean, in Newton's case, for obvious reasons, <coughs> the manuscripts survive, but I don't think we should let that trick us into, uh, into 
yeah, no, think you got Newton's particularly unique. This is all very true. I, uh, my sense, though, is that the size of Newton's manuscript corpus is that that's not common. Uh, two and a half million plus words uh, on theology. Um, I could, you know, I, I, I don't know uh, of others that have that wrote that much. Maybe, maybe, maybe they do exist. I mean, John Ray is another example. Uh, uh, so yeah, there are there are other examples, but no, this is a very good point. Uh, um, and then on this issue of Newton's singularity or not, I mean, the tension you raised between. He says sometimes, oh, we mustn't intrude philosophy into religion, but then he says experimental philosophy leads to God. I mean, I'm not sure. This seems to me a quite typical 17th century English mm -hmm. view. Mm -hmm. I, indeed, even before, everyone thinks that you read the preface to any natural philosophy textbook, Latin in the Aristotelian tradition or not, and they all say we do this to, and we'll get we'll get natural theology, we'll get God. Of course, then they probably don't talk about God that much in the actual textbook, but everyone says that natural philosophy will lead to God, but everyone also says, oh, but, but don't let your Greek pagan philosophy um, mm -hmm. yeah. affect your view of God ultimately. Any revealed truths are from the Bible. Of course, what conclusions they draw from that differ hugely. Newton draws the conclusion that the Trinity is a pagan fable most other people do not. But, but, but structurally, methodologically, mm -hmm. I think it's a pretty standard position. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, very well. Uh, well, let's give Professor Squire. Yeah. Uh, 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 sorry again about my voice. Um, I was really interested to see you uh, <clears throat> quote that passage from The Principles of Philosophy. Uh, it's a very important document, and I, I seem to remember that I published it some years ago. I, I think that's correct. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to say, small comment, that this is the only place I know in which Newton explicitly brings the optics under uh, the first principle, which is God. I know of no other document that does that explicitly. So what we have here, is a unification not only of his natural philosophy, the principia and the optics and, and, and so forth, but we also have, uh, the, uh, as it were, a boxing in of these natural philosophies under uh, the systematic theology. So I think that's important to, to, to develop in your paper, perhaps. Thank you very much. Standing between a person and lunch is a dangerous thing. Thank you. Um, I, I learned a lot from this, and, and I'm thinking a great deal. I just, I just wanted to make a plea. Perhaps this isn't fair, but for using the actors' categories and being more mm. historically specific, mm. because I, I do think it can confuse us mm -hmm. when we say science and religion, and then we think, well, we actually know what that really means. Mm -hmm. But then actually your text, that is your, your talk, substantively, I think, can get us confused about what that means. Let me give you one example. So it, clearly one of the most important passages for you is when he says in the General Scolium, in the second edition, um, to discourse about God from the appearances of things certainly does pertain to experimental philosophy, then in the third it's natural philosophy. That, I think, tells us what he takes the previous paragraph, discussion, to be about. And saying that it's religion or theology is not obviously correct. Mm -hmm. If he's telling us to, to discourse about God is part of experimental philosophy or natural philosophy. In some ways, the second edition is a more radical statement. The idea that discoursing about God is part of experimental philosophy is quite a fascinating notion. And as, as I'll say tomorrow, there's a real question, how can you learn about the actual infinity of a substantially omnipresent being by running experiments or studying the phenomena, given that they are always finite, or at least it seems. Um, anyway, I think the way to go would be to say, what is the contrast? So if it pertains to experimental philosophy, I would say as opposed to what? As opposed to theology, as opposed to religion, as opposed to another kind of philosophy like metaphysics. Certainly every metaphysician is talking about um, 
the divine being from Descartes, et cetera, on Leibniz too. So maybe he's saying God doesn't just pertain to metaphysics, it also pertains to experimental philosophy. Or maybe he's saying it pertains to natural philosophy, not merely to theology. So I would urge you to take, this, take that line to help you interpret what category to apply to that. So are, are you saying that when he says discoursing about God does pertain to natural philosophy, it's just God within natural philosophy. It doesn't imply theology in a broader sense, that God well, just becomes um, part of that discussion. The question is why, why say, okay, that's enough discussion of God mm -hmm. and discussing God mm -hmm. does pertain to yeah. experimental philosophy as opposed to what? Yeah. What did he think we would normally, if he hadn't written that one sentence, mm -hmm. what would we normally think mm -hmm. he was discussing? Yeah, if you but, see what but I mean. in the previous paragraph, he actually goes into theology proper. Yes, so then why add that sentence? Mm -hmm. what, what does that tell you? Yeah. It's no, clearly it's important. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we need to do more thinking about that. Absolutely, yeah, thanks. All right, I think, well, someone said last night, as I recall, historical specificity or something to that effect can be occasionally very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, on that note,